All right, next up from the Supreme Court, Duncan versus Bonta. The case Duncan versus Bonta, which challenges the California Penal Code, which bans magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds. The NRA, the NRA filed suit against California in 2017, five years ago, mm-hmm. and won a favorable, favorable decision at the district court in 2019. California appealed that to the Ninth Circuit, and in August of 2020, the three-judge panel ruled that the statute was unconstitutional. In November of 2021, however, the full Ninth Circuit ignored Supreme Court precedents and upheld the ban. And the Supreme Court just turned it back and said, y'all got to look at this again. We're going to vacate this previous decision. And you, now you got to use Bruin, that new decision that everyone was all upset about in New York. You got to consider that and whether or not you're going to uphold this ban. So they just sent it back. And that's good. That's going to end up being a win. Or they're going to be able to bring it back to the Supreme Court if it's not a win, and they'll probably win. Mm. That's essentially what they're saying. Yes. So that's good news. There you go. That was from Costco. Yeah. He made White Pill Wednesday. Okay. Rapid fire. So still can't get anything yet. No. No. they're, They're forcing the Ninth Circuit to reconsider the ban. All right. Now we're going to get to some real, real white pills. That was a gum one. That was a good one. Now we're going to get to some more real white pills. You know, we like talking about technology. We like talking about innovations, achievements, the great things that we are actually moving towards in society, and even some some great heartwarming uh, stories from time to time. We'll look at these conjoined twins that were separated with the help of virtual reality. These three-year-olds underwent surgery in Rio de Janeiro with a direction Of a hospital in London, the team spent months trialing techniques using virtual reality projections of the twins based on CT and MRI scans. Hmm. So it was one of the most complex separation processes ever completed, according to the charity which funded it, and which was founded in 2018. So for the first time, surgeons in separate countries wore headsets and operated in the same virtual reality room together. So they... They had to do a, seven different really complicated surgeries, and to make sure that this went well, they basically performed the surgeries using a VR headsets and in the virtual reality room and practiced on projections of the of the kids. And uh, I mean, that's cool. That's, that's that's pretty good. It's pretty awesome. I mean, I support plus, that. Plus, I mean, I mean imagine. I can see this technology going further, especially into other third world countries. Imagine doctors like not being able to travel to Africa, let's say, but they could virtually help another doctor mm-hmm. in Africa that's already there and help coach them and train or train them, whatever it is, maybe during surgery by being able to view the surgery at the same time and have a virtual uh, machine or whatever that you can control. From somewhere else. I mean, that's really awesome. They just have like VR connected to the Tesla robot. And it's just going to be like this little Tesla robot surgeon. It's mm-hmm. going to go in and do stuff. I mean, they've already got robots doing surgery and stuff. And anyway, they might but... as well implant a Neuralink while they're in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Rapid fire. Let's go. All right. Got another good health one. From Scientific American. Algorithm that detects sepsis cut deaths by nearly 20%. That's a that's, big one. It's pretty good. That's better than the COVID vaccine. <laughs> Hospital patients are at risk of a number of life-threatening complications, especially sepsis, a condition that can kill within hours and contributes to one of three in-hospital deaths in the U.S. Overworked doctors and nurses often have little time to spend with each, with each, with each patient, which has been, been made even worse mm-hmm. now. And this problem can go unnoticed until it's too late. Academics and elect, which basically means you get an infection. Mm. Like going to the hospital is a bad thing. You know, you don't want to stay there. It's it's a pretty good place of death. Going to the hospital has a pretty high death rate. Yeah. Academics and electronic health record companies have developed an automated system that sends reminder checks to patients for sepsis, but the sheer number of alerts that cause healthcare providers to ignore or turn off these notices. Now, one algorithm has proved its value in real hospitals, helping doctors and nurses treat sepsis cases early, uh, nearly two hours earlier on average and cutting the condition's hospital mortality rate by 18%. Roughly 1.7 million adults in the U.S. develop sepsis each year, and about 270,000 of them die, according to the CDC. Now, it can be, and the reason why hours matter is because, remember, um, when you have sepsis, it's typically a bacterial infection, and the 
rate at which the bacteria multiply, uh, that that's why hours matter. Mm-hmm. The sooner you can get to killing the bacteria, the sooner that they stop replicating and can stop destroying your innards. You're talking about decreasing the uh, mortality rate by <clears throat> 18% in the hospitals. You got something that uh, a quarter million people die from every year. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. That's good. Mm-hmm. I like it. Okay. That's why we're talking about it. It can get bad. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the next one. That's how my dad lost his legs. Really? Yeah. Mm. True story. Lieutenant dad. Mm -hmm. Feel bad for him. He he had uh, at one point, luckily he was talking to um, his, yeah, his wife at the time. And he was out on an oil rig and was just talking and all of a sudden started slurring his speech and everything. Mm. Full on passed out from being... uh, from being too sick and so luckily because he was like in a room by himself she called the the rig and said hey i think you need to go check on tommy and they got him to the hospital mm. otherwise he probably would have died if it would have cut off more had, than the legs if he wouldn't have been talking to her well that was uh that was good luck right there that's why you should always talk to your wife everyone <laughs> always call and talk to your mm-hmm. wife at all times of the day could save your life okay next thing we're going to go on to some green Energy, we always bring up something nuclear, but the U.S. nuclear regu- regulator is green lighting its first small modular reactor. Now, this is one that we talked about over across the pond uh, a while back. We talked about this same thing. But now, even the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is getting involved in approving this, this small modular reactor. So the first one's been approved by the NRC. It's from New Scale. And uh, ticker symbol SMR, which makes no sense. New scales, tidy reactor Small design. Small modular reactor, SMR. Oh, I didn't read the first line right yeah, there. there you go. Small modular reactor, SMR. That's why their ticker's SMR. That's why it's SMR. I skipped the first line. Yeah. <laughs> New scales, tidy reactor design. Could Okay, could have been TRD. Could, yeah. Promises safe, clean energy at radically reduced cost, land use, and installation time meaning it's going to be nuclear power that is way cheaper and easier to implement when you need it. And safer. And safer also. This is just the seventh design approved by the NRC since it was established in 1974. Wow. Why can't we get nuclear going in the U.S., Charlie? Uh, Well. (laughs) No idea. No, no reason why. And the first of a coming wave of technologies designed to make nuclear power cheaper, easier, and safer to implement than ever before. The key to this small modular reactor, uh, th- here's the reason that it's so cheap and better than all the other ones that we have right now. They can make it in a factory, and then they can replicate that in a factory, and then they can bring it to whatever the spot is. See, right now, if you want a nuclear power plant, you got to get all those permits and go through all that stuff and spend years and years just going through that. Then you got to start building, dealing with paying for the land and doing all this the whole time where you're building. Well, now they can build this in a factory and they can ship this uh, to wherever it needs to go. Mm-hmm. And it makes power. The only problem is it's still water. Like the, the thing I liked about Bill Gates the, the, or a company he's invested in design was that it was cooled by liquid metal, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. means it can't evaporate. Yeah. Water can always evaporate if it gets too hot. Just keep evaporating. Well, they got light water. So they, it well, goes at least these slower. are smaller. So if they, yeah. if they do melt down, it won't affect as many things. You know, I just like that they're trying stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. Hey, and they have a whole team. Stay, staying on energy here for a minute. Let's talk about your blowhole. Mm hmm. Everybody's got one of those. Mm hmm. Um, from New Atlas, uh, blowhole wave energy generator exceeds expectations in its 12-month test. The Uniwave system is a floatable device that can be towed to any coastal location and connected to a local energy grid. It's designed so that wave swells force water into a specially designed concrete chamber, pressurizing the air in the chamber and forcing it through an outlet valve. Then as water recedes, it generates a powerful vacuum which sucks air in through a turbine at the top and generates electricity that's fed into the grid via a cable. Blowhole energy, baby. Mm -hmm. As a result, it draws energy from the entire column of water that enters its chamber, a fact the team says makes it more efficient than the wave energy devices that only harvest energy from the surface of the sea floor. That's another cool innovation Mm -hmm. that they can tow to wherever they want to put it. 
and they can build. So here, what's the point of all this stuff? The point is, like we mentioned on pretty much every single White Pill Wednesday, I think, is that we don't want the government to pick winners and losers when it comes to the future of energy, which is what they're trying to do. And say they stick with solar panels or wind farms. Well, those take up tons of land. And those can drastically, drastically increase the value of land, which is great if you own land. It's not great if you're a young person looking to uh, get a house or buy some land, something also like that. expensive. Yeah, it also takes away farmland potential, which can then make crops more expensive, stuff like that. A lot of bad things. And, uh, you know, you got to have the batteries and all that. Now, this one probably still going to have something to do with batteries if they're generating en- energy. But waves... Them waves. I don't know if you know this. It's probably killing fish, you know. There's probably downsides mm. to this, too. <clears throat> probably hurting the coral mm. in the area, the you endangered take coral. This to Australia. No. There's no way. Mm-mm. But but to Nate's point, all of this to say, it's like, let the best man win. Yeah. Let the market come up with all kinds of crazy ways to generate cheap energy for the, for the goodness of mankind and womankind. I'm not a sexist, all right? <laughs> and, and then let the best, like, if it is solar power, we're not, I'm not against solar power. I just right now, it's not very efficient. If it ends up being solar power, well, hooray. That's hooray great. for everyone. Let's see who wins. But we, we should stop this, like, impossible decision making by a group of people who think that they know what's best, stealing your money and giving it to them because they know what's best. Because they don't. They they have no idea. Do you need us to play the Nancy Pelosi video that we played yesterday? And all the time I Again. hear arguments from the left is like, well, you know, didn't NASA help, you know, invent the Internet? That's their argument. Against, isn't the public-private partnership what we really, like, but look at what SpaceX did. Yeah. Sure, NASA may have, you know, quote-unquote pioneered with government help or whatever, but you're telling me that somebody wouldn't have thought to build a, build a rocket, you know, mm-hmm. without NASA's help? Well, there were people building rockets. There's a whole movie made about it. It's right. uh, pretty good. Got Billy Bob Thornton in it. You should go watch that. Before NASA yeah. Was, was, yeah, exactly. So we don't need a group of central planners. And also what I wanted to say back, you were talk, you referenced maybe a little bit of that podcast you were showing me yesterday when he says, well, didn't NASA help invent the internet? I'm like, okay, yeah, well, whose money did NASA use to right. do that? NASA doesn't have money. They don't have anything that they don't take from people in the private market. So stop trying to destroy the private market. Okay, white pill. Rapid fire. Here we go. This is good. I'm going to play this video. This is cool. Look at this drone. Whoever invented drones is helping people, helping save people's lives. Probably NASA. Probably NASA. was the government that did this. Oh, mm-hmm. It could have been. Probably for military use or something like that. Watch a drone save a 14-year-old from drowning in a powerful Spanish current or L current. A pioneering <laughs> drone lifeguard service rolled out across Spanish beaches has saved the life of a 14 year old boy as he struggled against the powerful current. We're going to play the video. So this is cool. This company, they send out these rescue drones and what they do is if there's someone that's way out there and it's too dangerous for a lifeguard to go out there at that point, that little thing goes out there and drops a life jacket down to the person that's, that's drowning. They just suspend it down with this little string and it holds it until the person grabs it and then they release it. And then they got a life jacket so it makes, the, oh, damn, never mind. I'm not going to, I was going to go way too far on that one. I stopped myself. I'll tell you the joke later on. Okay. <laughs> it was, it was going to be a good one. Okay. Let's go to the video and let's watch this kid get saved. This is a rumble video. It's also probably faster to do a drone. Oh yeah. It just goes right on out there. <clears throat> and they're cheaper than helicopters. So here's this video. I don't know if there's any sound on it, but there's this um, kid out there. 14 years old, in the water. No sound on the video. Just getting wrecked Some of those by cheap the drones without sound. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. Just absolutely. Oh. So they're dangling this life jacket down to the kid from this drone. He grabs it. It releases it. Kid doesn't die. He gets to sit out there until the lifeguards get there with their, uh, with their jet ski. Innovation, that company, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the name of the company, but um, that's good that they're able to do this. General Drones has 30 surf rescue drones with operators to lifeguard stations across 22 beaches along Spain's coast. And yes. they released that video probably for marketing. But you know what? They deserve it. That's pretty cool. All right. Something you don't hear every day the, from the Washington Post. 
Kansasans resoundingly <laughs> reject amendment amid aimed at restricting abortion rights. In a major victory for abortion rights, Kansas voters on Tuesday rejected an effort to strip away the state's abortion protections, sending a decisive message about the issue's popularity in the first political test since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade in June. Why is this on White Pill Wednesday, Charlie? I don't know yet. Okay. The question presented to voters here was whether abortion protections should be stripped from the state constitution. A yes vote would allow Kansas's Republican-led legislature to pass future limits on abortion or ban it altogether in its coming session in January. A no vote would leave those protections in place. With 90% of the vote counted, 60% of voters wanted to maintain those abortion protections, compared with 40% who wanted to remove them from the state's constitution. Now this, I think this is a white pill because it's the local people deciding exactly what they want to do. Look at what happened. That got, it got put on the ballot in Kansas. The people got together and they voted and they voted to keep their protections in place. Now, whether or not we agree with that or, or any of that, they're making the point. They're making the exact point. The state's deciding. The mm-hmm. people decided. It, now this is tyranny. <laughs> Just so you know. This is tyranny. The people in their state getting together and voting. Democratic tyranny. That is anti-democracy right there. Going on a majority vote on a proposition. But the left will on celebrate the ballot. this one. Yeah. Now, this is completely anti-democratic somehow. <laughs> Just so you know, literal democracy taking place. Even if you don't agree with the outcome or whatever, we got actual democracy taking place in this very anti-democratic, tyrannical decision coming down from the Supreme mm. Court. Okay, on to the the main topic of the day. So, I was trying Did to we decide. Did we get through that rapidly <clears throat> enough? For that rapid? was pretty rapid, yeah. I mean, that was for your rapid fire. It's so 1 1.40 p.m. right now, and we're on to the, uh, the main topic, which is, I guess, not really a white pill. That's why I said mostly white pill, but we just covered like, I don't know, like six white pills right there. That's enough pills for one day, if I ever heard of it. We'll cover it this way. So here's the question. We had all these, um, we had these midterm elections last night across the country. A bunch of states did anyway. And, uh, you know, you could say maybe some far right wing Republicans won. And so we'll start with the question here from an article from Yahoo News. Democrats are saying that these Republicans are the most extreme Republicans to ever run for office. So why are they helping them win? Why are they helping them win? Okay. If the Democratic Party is to be believed, the coming midterm elections will herald the most radical field of right-wing Republican candidates to ever run for office. Joe Biden summed up the pitch ahead of 20, the 2022 November elections, talking about the MAGA movement, the most extreme political organization that's existed in American history. <laughs> Not KKK. <laughs> Not even that. No. MAGA. It's the worst. So why are Democrats trying so hard to help them win? Across the country, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Illinois, Democratic groups are bankrolling political ads to bolster fringe Republican candidates. The aim of that support is to elevate extreme GOP candidates over their moderate rivals during primary season with the expectation that they will be easier to beat in a general election. So that is the gamble that they're taking right now. And what I, would, what I will tell you is that actually for Democratic Party establishment people, this is a win-win for them. They either put up all these extreme candidates and they win because those candidates are too extreme, or those candidates win and the Democratic Party wins because they get to talk about how crazy all these people are and raise more money in the future. Mm-hmm. Among the candidates being promoted by Democrats are Dub, Doug, not Dub, <laughs> Doug Mastriano, a Pennsylvania state senator running for governor who worked to overturn the 2020 election. This article is from just a little while back, but we're going to follow it up with more recent stuff. Then there's Dan Cox. Wait. Or, what? This guy even chartered buses to the U.S. Capitol on Jan 6. Ooh. That's so you bad. know he's, he's got a lot most- of money. He's the most extreme. (laughs) Very extreme. Of any Republican you could imagine. Then there's Dan Cox, Republican gubernatorial candidate in Maryland, who has pushed the same election fraud falsehoods. Larry Hogan, the departing GOP governor, called Cox a conspiracy theory believing QAnon whack job, or a CTBQWJ for short. But now he's the primary candidate. Mm -hmm. In Arizona, GOP candidate Carrie Lake 
said she would not have certified Joe Biden's victory in Arizona she was, as she was required to do so by law and has repeatedly spread falsehoods about the 2020 election. She's also receiving help from Democrats. Democrats have been airing ads that are an attack on their rivals, but in truth are designed to boost them with, re- with Republican voters. And I've got some of the ads. They're genius ads. Okay. Now, this is a, this is a terrible thing for them to be doing. But the ads that they're running are freaking genius. You can't be mad. Because. Honestly. You have to be impressed. The ads go both ways. They can either be talking to Democrats about how terrible these people are and we must stop them. Or it's an ad for like the hardcore Trump supporter people about why they should vote for them. And it's it's genius. Brilliant. So I want to play a couple of them. We're playing checkers. The Democrat Party is playing chess. Exactly. Uh, Here's one for Joe Gibbs, who we haven't... Wait, not Joe Gibbs. That can't be it. John Gibbs. Joe Gibbs. Someone totally different. All right, let's play the one from John Gibbs. 30-second ad. John Gibbs is too conservative for West Michigan. Handpicked by Trump to run for Congress, Gibbs called Trump the greatest president and worked in Trump's administration with Ben Carson. Gibbs has promised to push that same conservative agenda in Congress. A hard line against immigrants at the border and so-called patriotic education in our schools. The Gibbs-Trump agenda is too conservative for West Michigan. DCCC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Now, you could say, well, they said he's too conservative for West Michigan. But all that stuff that they said at the first part of the ad is all stuff that people who support Trump would love to hear from people. They would love it. And so there's a couple other, even, even in Illinois some people that they're pushing here. Let me get down to some of these other ads. Oh gosh, just a bunch of screenshots. Where are the ads? Let's play Illinois. We'll play their ad real quick. This one I think is for Dan Bailey in Illinois. Someone running against J.B. Pritzker? Richard Irvin sure seems to like him. It is my honor to bring to the podium a great friend a great leader who has guided our state with professionalism and compassion throughout this entire pandemic. Fortunately, we have a partner at the state level who not only sees the vision, he believes in the vision. Thank you, Governor Pritzker, for being here today and for making black and brown communities a priority. Richard Irvin, a great friend, a great leader. Why is he even running? <laughs> okay, so that ad was just showing the people in Illinois that Richard Irvin, well, he is clearly a supporter of J.B. Pritzker. You know, so once again, the content of these ads is uh, is genius. And you can't say that they're not Democratic ads either. Like they're they're still talking. They're saying like things that Democrats would disagree with about these people. So I don't know. Charlie, do you think that they're being shady? Do you think this is going to be a good plan for them? I think it's a genius plan. Yeah. An absolute. Yeah. Are you mad about it? I can't be mad. (laughs) It's impressive. It's a, it's now it's a risky idea uh, because, you know, you got to beat the candidate, but it, I think it's genius, especially like, cause most people, most people are in the middle, right? But there are a lot of, you know, Trump fans. So we'll see. Oh gosh, there's tons of them, tons of ads in here. In this article, they talk about in Illinois, just for Dan Bailey, there was $37 million spent basically trying to pump up Dan Bailey in Illinois. And we keep asking, like, why would they do this? I mean, there's there's tons. There's got to be 20 ads on that website right there. Just the play buttons aren't showing up right now, so we're skipping over it. So going on, by the way, we mentioned Carrie Lake. I don't think that, I don't think that one has been called yet. But uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, they're talking about uh, Mastriano again. I believe that person did win. I'm going to get down to some of the most recent ones. The DGA, that's the Democratic Governors Association in Illinois, uh, along with the party itself, $37 million uh, to push against Richard Irvin or in favor of, uh, in favor of Bailey. I think Darren Bailey is his name. So why would they do this, Charlie? What's the, what's the reason? And the Washington Post today gave us the answer. All right. Several election deniers backed by Trump prevail in hotly contested primaries. Boom. 
Several election deniers, backed by former President Donald Trump, prevailed in the primaries Tuesday as a nationwide battle over the future of the GOP played out in a state and federal races across five states. In Michigan, Peter, uh, one, one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Trump last year, fell in defeat to John Gibbs, a former Trump administration official who ran with the ex-president's support and embraced his false claims of stolen election. In Arizona, state lawmaker Mark uh, Fincham, I guess. Fincham, part of a national coalition of far-right candidates who baselessly reject the 2020 election results, was projected to win the Republican nomination for GOP Secretary of State. Blake Masters, a first-time candidate who spent most of his career in Silicon Valley as a, a protege of a tech billionaire, Peter Thiel, and has said he thinks Trump won in 2020, was projected to win by Republican nomination for U.S. Senate in the, in the state. Both were backed by Trump. And the Democratic Party. The, yeah. <laughs> a third Arizona candidate supported by Trump, former TV news anchor Carrie Lake, was in a tight race for the GOP uh, gubernatorial nomination that had yet to be called early Wednesday morning. In Missouri, uh, Attorney General Eric Schmidt won his state's GOP nomination for U.S. Senate. As Attorney General, Schmidt backed a Texas-led lawsuit seeking to overturn the 2020 election results in four key states Trump lost. Some Republicans also fear Trump's picks in the battleground areas could undermine their party's chances in November as they seek to capitalize on low approval ratings for Biden, rising inflation, and concerns about crime. So what you're seeing play out right now is the Democrats know, as I talked about when we mentioned whether or not Trump was going to announce that he was running in November, the Democrats need this election to be about Donald Trump. They need it. They need to talk about January 6th. They need to talk about Trump. Because if they don't, then they got to defend what's going on in the country right now. And they don't want to do that at all because it's not good. Mm. So they, they don't want to have to do that. And instead, this election needs to be about Trump. So the Democratic Party has put hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions at least, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, into pushing the more strong, far right-wing candidates. I'm not saying all these people are terrible. I don't know anything about really their ideas. They said they think Trump won the election, or they think the election was stolen. Um, I, don't, I don't know that they're right about that, although I don't actually know that they're wrong. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. We so, don't know the actual yeah. answer. I don't know. Yeah. Anyone says that they know is probably blind. So or, so what What are they doing We've here? They want to run against Trump. That could add to these questions. Yeah. That's it. And so this is a, uh, I, I don't know how long this tactic has been going on, but it is genius. It's very smart. And it's also very diabolical and manipulative and could end up with some really, really bad ramifications for the future if these people really do suck. And I just want everyone to remember when the Democrats are going on and on and on, if some of these people actually do win in November and they're going on and on about how terrible these people are, that it was likely the Democratic Party that literally got these people elected and put them in office. Also, they could either win in November, which might not work for them, or, like I said, it's win-win, or so they can talk about how crazy far right-wing extremists the Republicans are. This is a win-win situation. So they situation. can win in 2024. So they can win in 24. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Like I said, so like the Democratic Party officials, if you don't actually care about anything that's going on, you only care about your own power and your own money, then you don't actually care what this outcome is. This is only a good opportunity for you. If they win, you get to use this to raise more money for 24. If they lose, then you get power right now, and that's good too. I don't know if there's any bad outcomes for the people sitting up there in their in their ivory towers uh, just counting dollar bills, mm. you know, talking about their own power all the time. Anyway, that's a rather non-white pill way to end the show. But I think, yeah, you can, it's it's definitely genius. Mm -hmm. You were telling me about this. I had no idea. You were telling me about this this morning. I was like, oh, my God. Now, we're probably going to see this strategy play on both sides now, I bet. You know, it's going to be it's going to be the Republicans are going to try to do this as well. You know, back yeah. in the extreme lefties because they think that they can win those against the primaries, make it easier so that maybe the race isn't so tight. For instance, in Kentucky, you know where they could have probably won the gubernatorial race mm -hmm. against Andy Bashir, 
a little bit easier had they put up somebody who was more extreme left wing because Andy Bashir was pretty moderate. If that and, pesky Libertarian Party wouldn't have been in there in Kentucky, that's, you know, could have ended up with a Republican. Maybe the Democrats gave the Libertarian Party money. <laughs> That's a good strategy yeah. too. You maybe they're going to back libertarians money. Maybe they're going to end up backing Shane Hazel in Georgia. Should have never gave you libertarians <laughs> money. <laughs> All right, y'all. If you enjoyed today's show, this White Pill Wednesday, go out there and do something good for someone. Uh, get you know, give someone a smile. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a simple smile, especially after all this COVID stuff. We didn't get to see people's faces. Go out there and show your face. They want to see your face. Okay, do something nice for someone today. And, uh, you know, share the show with a friend, a family member, a foe. We really appreciate the help. The numbers are up again, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like going in here and looking at the numbers for a while there, we told you guys like, ooh, things aren't growing as we expect them to. And now they are again. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all thanks to all of you, all the new listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. Continue to share the show. Leave a rating and review. That helps us out more than you know. Go buy some merch. GodHatesFeds.com. Go do it. And then also, I want you to join the live group. I would love it if you went to joingml.com. If you do all of those things, all of them. Every single one. We're going to check tonight to see if every single one of you did every single one of those things. We'll be back again tomorrow. Hope you have a good day and a good morning. Liberty. <laughs>